Thank you for joining our Resilience Playbook webinar this afternoon about the environmental case for housing. This webinar is part of a series that highlights the key climate challenges and opportunities from the, in the Bay Area that the Bay Area faces by bringing together experts and thought leaders from around the region to present on the most pre prevalent issues in our region. My name is Zoe Siegel and I am the Director of Climate Resilience at Greenbelt Alliance. Today, we are very excited to be joined by our executive director and fearless leader, Amanda Brown Stevens, and Dr. Karen Chappell, who is the Professor Emerita of City and Regional Planning at the University of California, Berkeley, and the director of the School of Cities and Professor of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. Dr. Chappell has been at the forefront of research into neighborhood change, sustainable development, and regional planning throughout her exploration of topics from transit-oriented development to urban displacement and ADU viability. She co-founded the Urban Displacement Project at UC Berkeley, has published numerous books on sustainable planning, governance, and equitable development, and was awarded the Fulbright Global Scholar Award to name just a few of her many accolades. Dr. Chappell's research not only features rigorous data science, but also enlightening community case studies and historical context that is essential to connecting the dots between complex topics of equity, climate change, and economic development that are so key to advancing action to address our dual crises of housing and security and climate change and issues that are really important to us as an organization. We'd also like to thank our partners in presenting this webinar today, California YIMBY, Housing Action Coalition, Save the Bay, SPUR, Urban Environmentalist, YIMBY Action, and all of the other uh, partners who have really helped spread the word, share the playbook and, and engage with our, with our work over the years. So thank you so much. And with that, I will pass it off to Amanda. Thanks so much, Zoe. And uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, talking with Karen Chapel and with all of you. Before we get started on our deeper dive here, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about Greenbelt Alliance in case this is your first time joining us. Greenbelt Alliance is an environmental nonprofit organization based here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. We do this by leveraging our expertise in land use policy advocacy and regional collaboration. And we publish original research and create tools that guide local planners and advocates on climate adaptation issues. Uh, in that vein, uh, and to drive uh, powerful local advocacy, we recently developed the Resilience Playbook. Hopefully many of you are already familiar with this, um, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview uh, because it really is a great way to fit to introduction to our comprehensive and holistic view of regional resilience. The playbook brings together a collection of curated strategies, resources, and toolkits from around the region to support local decision-making community leaders as they look to accelerate climate resilience around and the region's adaptation to climate risks. The policies connect nature and resilience. They leverage our natural and working lands as defense mechanisms to absorb flood water, so sequester carbon, protect water supply, and provide buffers to wildfires. Along with that, we address critical issues of housing justice, a just transition away from fossil fuels toward green jobs, and environmental justice in order to ensure the outcomes of these policies prioritize the resilience of our most vulnerable communities. We hope this can be a great tool for practitioners and advocates engaging in local planning efforts like the housing elements updates. Housing elements are a community's blueprint for where to grow and they're all being updated. Every community in the Bay Area is updating that this year. So with this quick plug for checking out our resilience playbook, which provides that holistic view of how we build resilience, I wanna turn now to the topic at hand and dive a bit more into our into the housing climate connection. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics, and I think one of the most interesting topics we, we tackle here at Greenbelt Alliance. We're fortunate to live in a region with a strong level of environmental awareness. We have lots of amazing community activists in, in the environment, in climate, working on a myriad of issues. And at the same time, many of us know that as climate activists, it can be very frustrating because we see inaction at the federal level and beyond that feels out of our control. Fortunately, one of the exciting things about our work is that we have significant and meaningful action we can take at the local level 
actively participating to become more resilient to climate change, to reduce our climate in impact, and to be more inclusive as a region. Seems like a triple win, right? All we have to do is build more homes right here in our own neighborhoods, towns, and cities. So as we approach regional growth from a holistic lens, to us, this really feels like a natural connection. To protect the environment, we need to build more homes and cities. But we know that many of our environmental and climate partners and friends are somewhat new to the field of housing policy and don't necessarily think of these things together. So what I wanna do for this presentation before we get into the discussion today is go through some of the biggest, most common questions we get about the environmental impact on housing and uh, answer some of those questions. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Chapel. So why does where we build matter? Transportation accounts for the largest portion of total greenhouse gas emissions in the US, 30% of our um, GHG emissions. And in California, where we're actually doing a better job than most on converting to clean energy, our transportation sector, we're actually unfortunately not quite as uh, forward thinking on our transportation sector. And, our trans and that's 50% of greenhouse gas emissions in the state come from transportation. This has also stayed flat in recent years as we've seen dramatic drops in energy sector emissions. So this is a lot of talk about transportation. We're talking about housing here. What's the connection here? Well, residents living in infill areas drive much few, much less than other people. Uh, I think a, a recent study showed that residents in infill areas drive 18 fewer miles per day than other residents, um, which if we shifted where people lived, we could reduce the equivalent of say 400,000 cars on the road. So that creates not just environmental impacts, but many other benefits, uh, reduced economic costs and increased quality of life as people are, are able to live close to where they work, close to where their, their communities are and reduce that time in commute. Something that we've seen, a many of us had gotten the chance to see a benefit of um, during the pandemic in uh, as we've shifted our commute patterns. Denser forms of development can also reduce our dependence on personal vehicles, reduce travel times and costs I just mentioned, and of course, the consumption of oil and gas, um, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions significantly. This is the, the biggest individual impact we can make. Um, another question we get a lot is, how can building new homes reduce emissions? It feels like the construction costs, new construction, it seems like this actually creates more emissions. One, and you know, as, an, as an organization fo focused on land use, we don't necessarily have the expertise in details on uh, construction materials and that sort of thing, although there's some great research on there. But we do see that if we change zoning to allow for smaller homes, to allow for ADUs, um, and the types of duplexes and fourplexes that we've been talking about recently at a state level, these tend to use fewer emissions over the life cycle uh, of the home. And you know, these zoning changes actually, so we get those emissions reductions without any cost investment um, by the public uh, to get that benefit. Um, also new homes are, are built in a way that uses construction uh, methods that that have greenhouse gas reduction benefits. And um, wealthy Americans have per capita footprint of 25% higher than those in lower income residents. And a big part of that that has to do with larger homes. In especially affluent areas in the Bay Area, these emissions can be 15 times higher than nearby neighborhoods partly having to do with the density of those communities. So this can be a huge shift in reducing our greenhouse gas benefits by building more and smaller homes within existing communities. Finally, uh, or another thing I wanna talk about um, that one of the biggest questions we get, particularly now as we're entering uh, the second key month of our uh, rainy season with basically no rain, people worry, people have reasonable worries about water. And so uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the water impacts of new housing, but to step back again a little bit, I think philosophically 
as members of this community, one of the ways I think it's key for us to reframe a little bit how we approach some of these questions, because we hear a lot, what about water? We can't accommodate new residents because we don't have enough water. And I would say we need to slightly think about this approach differently. Water, like air, like some of these other things, it's a collective resource and it's a, it's a resource we need to approach collectively. Existing California residents, older residents, residents who've been here a long time, don't have an inherent right to the existing water in a different way than newer residents, younger residents, the new community, the new people we're welcoming, people who are moving here, people who are born, people who immigrate here. So we need to think about water is how are we using this resource collectively in a way that accommodates everyone and all of our needs. Fortunately, uh, there is some great research and our part, one of our partners, Spur, put out a study recently that showed that the Bay Area could add 2.1 million jobs um, and close to 7 million more people and 2 million more homes over the next 50 years and still offset all water use from this growth through modest improvements in water use efficiency, as well as critically more compact land use. Uh, so hopefully now you're thinking, wow, this, this is great. We need to build more housing. But uh, you know, a question that comes up, we have these extreme housing needs. Uh, wouldn't it be easier to just plan new developments outside of our cities without having to bother and get in the way of existing residents? So as Greenbelt Alliance, I want to make sure that we're highlighting some of the incredible benefits uh, our open spaces in the Bay Area provide, including clean air, clean water, recreation, food, habitat, and climate-related hazards make these even more important. So just want to take a couple minutes to think about how the land that surrounds us uh, protects and benefits us as well. So starting by talking about green belts around cities. And by green belts, I mean protected land surrounding existing communities. This can be parks, it can be ranch land, it can be farms and more. This land needs to be carefully maintained and stewarded. And if so, we have found that these green belts can reduce the size and number of extreme wildfires and protect the communities within those areas. Agricultural land that uses best management practices for regenerative, regenerative agriculture can serve an even critical role in reducing wildfire resilience and increasing uh, carbon capture as well. Additionally, as we think about where we go and where we protect uh, the communities along the bay, we need to ensure that we're protecting and restoring the wetlands that this natural infrastructure absorbs floodwaters, reducing flood risk for existing communities, as well as also sequestering carbon and protecting the critical biodiversity that's a key part of our communities. So it's really back to that holistic vision. We need to build enough homes within our existing communities to accommodate the people that we have and the people that that we need. And at the same time, we can protect the land around us, these, the land and the water that protects, that protects us as well. So uh, the final and biggest question that really comes up in this conversation is, do we have enough land? And again, fortunately, we've seen that if all of our available infill parcels, for example, if all of our available infill parcels in California were developed to their potential, we could have over 4 million existing housing units, which is more than enough to accommodate the growth that's planned uh, or estimated over the next number of years. And this would spare over 350,000 acres of undeveloped greenfield. However, that's not the trajectory we're on right now. That's not the way we're planning. So we need to really shift how we think about growth to get to get on to that, to that plan. And this is really getting into the topic that we're talking about today. We're in an inflection point and we need, to, we need to really choose as a society. Can we change the way we grow quickly and in a positive way, in a way that will protect our communities, that will build more vibrant, walkable places where people can live close to where they work, live close to the services they need, where communities can, uh, can stay, where kids can stay, where they grow up, where people can live uh, in multifamily 
uh, communities if they want? Or are we going to delay until we have nothing but more catastrophic paths along our way? Like I've talked here about housing policy as climate policy, but I just wanna to touch on for a moment that housing policy and increasing the number of homes also helps us address our, our other most critical issue in the Bay Area, which is that currently we don't have enough housing. And if we don't change the way we approach building homes, we're already starting to see those dire consequences of inaction in the extreme increases in homelessness we've seen in, in our region and in the many uh, friends, family members, colleagues, and others that have moved away. In this region, we've come together in challenging times before, we, we pride ourselves in leading the nation in innovations, in environmental protections, in technology. And unfortunately, today, we are in many ways leading the nation in um, what not to do around housing policy. And when we talk about environment, environmental protections, we need to take that into account and shift the way we, uh, the way we take action at the local level to reduce our climate impacts through this one simple step, accelerating housing growth within our cities and towns. The process to get there is challenging, but the answer to it's the best answer to what we can do at a local level without even worrying about what's happening at the national inter, international level to make climate impacts and create a better community. So with all that, I, I'm thrilled to um, talk to one of our um, leading experts on Bay Area housing policy and how to do it right to build inclusive communities uh, that best serve our region. Great. Um, uh, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. I loved your presentation too. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, it was uh, really fun. It was sort of brought me back to get an invitation from Greenbelt because I started working with Greenbelt in 2006. Um, and uh, great to see the work continue under Amanda. And uh, I was very excited to dig into the resilience playbook. And I have all these ideas for tools I want to add to it. So maybe we can talk later about that. Um, so when Amanda and the Greenbelt staff asked me to come, um, they asked me to talk about our reports uh, that we did for Next 10. So our first report in 2017 was Right Type, Right Place. And our second report uh, was just in 2021, Rebuilding for a Resilient Recovery. So Next 10, uh, had asked us to produce right type um, in order to make the case about the cost of sprawl and the benefits of infill. Lots and lots of academic studies had looked at the cost of sprawl before, but there really wasn't much on how infill could solve the problem, comparing directly the cost of sprawl to the cost of infill. So that was that report, which I'll talk about briefly in a second. And then um, a few years later, um, we were talking about updating the report and um, the fires in California were picking up at the time. And it became clear that we should be linking the fires in the wildland urban interface, the WUI, to the case for infill development. Um, so that was that report. And to, to produce this report, we had lots and lots of advice with our partners at the Nature Conservancy, um, uh, particularly about how to think about Greenbelt. And we also had Sadie Wilson, uh, who's now a Greenbelt staffer, um, and many other terrific Berkeley students uh, working with us. So in Right Type, Right Place, um, what we did is a simple model of what would happen if we put all future growth in California into uh, infill locations, and this is how we defined infill locations, anything in the purple ended up being an infill location. So it had to be transit accessible. 
And uh, then we put a three mile buffer around transit. Um, some, some definitions of infill are much uh, tighter, just say it's all just the area right around the station. We felt like it counts for infill um, as infill development if you had to, uh, you know, bike to the to the transit station or long walk um, or uh, even hop in your car and park in the park and ride lot. Um, that should still count as as infill uh, development. So so th these were the areas uh, in the Bay Area, and we were looking all across California. But in the Bay Area, this is the area that we we looked at um, um, placing all the infill development. And, and it's doable. We could build solely on infill in California. Um, and then we looked at the costs and the, 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 the sorry, these numbers are uh, hard to read, um, but you can, you can get a sense of a couple of the major impacts. The, the biggest uh, bang for the buck was of course in greenhouse gas emissions reduction, um, where with infill housing, the column in green, um, you, you could save 1.79 um, metric tons, million metric tons um, per uh, annually. Um, so you, you would get uh, some great climate impacts from, from infill development. And then we looked at, uh, excuse me, we looked at uh, economic growth and we looked at um, utilities and uh, transportation costs and a few other things. So you get a bump up in economic growth. Actually, it, 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 it has a positive economic impact to build more infill and less sprawl. And um, you get a savings in terms of how much you pay on your util utility bills and your transportation costs. So these were not huge impacts. They're small, but everything's in the right direction. And this was an extremely conservative picture. Um, we didn't talk about the costs of public infrastructure of sewers and roads and the savings you would get from building where there's existing sewers and, and roads. Um, we didn't talk about water costs. Um, we, we didn't account for um, reusing buildings and presumably a lot of infill development could come from just reutilizing our existing structures. And this is something we're learning right now in the missing middle debate, because we're seeing that you can actually produce affordable missing middle if you, uh, if you reuse um, single family homes and, and subdivide them and, uh, into duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. Um, and so reusing material would be another huge uh, savings. And there's also cost savings um, and sustainability benefits from, from material use. So if we're building infill, in the end, we're, we're just using a lot less concrete. And there's some super interesting uh, work coming out about that, which I can point you to if, you, if you're interested. So fast forward to our most recent work on wildfires in California. So, so we know about the risk to Californians um, who are um, living in the WUI and this 11 million member is something that you'll see in a lot of the media reports. Um, we looked in our study about of how many homes were specifically in high and very high fire risk areas. We found about one and a half million homes there. Then we calculated how much it would cost to replace them. Turns out it would be about over $600 billion just to replace uh, these homes. Um, so this is a very, very expensive proposition. And the question of who pays for that replacement is a real key one for California policymakers. Is it, is it the insurance companies that will pay when these, these homes burn down? Is it uh, the homeowners um, or is it the taxpayers of, uh, of California that will end up paying? And that's, that's what we don't quite know yet. Um, and there's a big debate coming out about this. Um, and then we looked at, at where new housing is occurring. Most uh, is actually occurring right now in the WUI. Um, the majority of new construction is in the WUI. We have currently zoning that allows for over a half million new units on top of the one and a half million existing in the WUI. 
Um, and this is a big concern because when, when our housing elements are calling for a lot more housing to be built, um, our zoning is telling the market, go build in the WUI. And that's a big problem. There's also a human cost. And one of the things we did, the students did in our study um, uh, uh, is look at where people end up after fire. Um, and, it, and there's an interesting story here. And we use the Paradise uh, 2018 fire here as the example. So at first blush, what jumps out, what might jump out to you is that the, the uh, after the Paradise fire, the residents of Paradise dispersed across the country, went everywhere, uh, all over. Um, and uh, yet, if you really think about what this map is saying, that big circle is right there in Butte County. Um, the, the vast majority of residents stayed in Butte County, um, went to Chico, or tried to return to Paradise. And this is true of fires all over California that you have uh, it, about 90% of the um, residents that are displaced by fire try to stay nearby in the county. Um, and, um, and so this is a big challenge. So we, want, we don't want people to lose their homes. We don't want them to lose their social networks, their schools, their jobs, et cetera. Um, yet um, yet it's, it's not going to be sustainable for everybody to move back home. So in the big picture, wildfires in California are a big deal in terms of emissions. Um, and this is a next, from the next 10 uh, Green Innovation Index. They do this every year. Um, and uh, obviously transportation is the biggest emitter in California. And Amanda already talked about how uh, this is uh, related to our commuting patterns in part. Um, and um, our grid is another problem, our industrial uses, but look at wildfire um, and look at that, um, how far that set us back just in 2018 uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, that orange bar. So in the study, we, we wanted to look at solutions um, and, and we had some goals. We, and it, we wanted to create a win-win situation. We wanna reduce wildfire vulnerability, first of all. And we do that by limiting new growth and mitigating existing development. We wanna promote housing supply and resiliency. So we wanna solve the housing crisis at the same time as we're reducing uh, wildfire vulnerability, or at least we wanna make the housing situation uh, better. We don't want to make it worse. Um, and then we want to we want to preserve open and working lands. And this is the part that the Nature Conservancy really helped us uh, think about how uh, how this should be part of the goal as well. Our three case studies in the study, um, which uh, you can see on the Next Ten website. Um, are uh, the, the Camp Fire, the Tubbs Fire in Santa Rosa and the Thomas Fire in Ventura. And we looked at three different scenarios for, for rebuilding. Uh, the first was managed retreat. And uh, this is the idea um, that um, most of the community afterwards will retreat, will leave, will relocate to other places. Um, and then um, there'll be safe infill development um, in the core of the area afterwards, but not in the WUI. Um, the managed retreat idea, again, is what the Nature Conservancy was working on and uh, had done some work in Paradise and thinking about the uh, green belt um, around, around Paradise um, that would, would mean that most of the current residents or the majority would have to leave. Um, the second alternative um, that the class, our students came up with was resilience nodes. And I thought this was super interesting and super creative and really should be looked at closely by policymakers in California. And this was the idea that you could rebuild uh, in some of these high risk areas, um, but you could make these uh, rebuilt areas uh, much more uh, resilient and you would do it by putting green belts uh, around little urban villages and you would do it by having walkable dense nodes um, in the middle of, of some of the high risk areas. And then the third alternative was, was to just rebuild as usual. 
And I'll just give two examples of what this might look like. I've already mentioned Paradise was a managed retreat case. Um, um, and um, uh, this, was, is, this is how it would um, pan out. What you would get a lot of environmental benefits by, uh, by creating this green belt uh, in, the, in the Wuyi area around Paradise. Um, and um, you would save a lot, of course, in terms of insurance costs. Um, Santa Rosa was a great example of how the resilience nodes could work out if you built, uh, you could still build in some of those uh, areas where there's existing subdivisions, uh, but you would, uh, you would have new walkable nodes. Um, this would have considerable economic benefits, interestingly, and equity benefits as people can stay and have reduced commute times. Um, and, uh, but there would still likely be some, some risk. So there's different ways to rebuild. Um, we ended up recommending five different major types of policies, and you can go to the report and read about them. Um, uh, obviously, we, we need to figure out new revenue streams and new ways to finance our uh, disasters. Um, and we're going to have to figure out ways of moving forward. And, and um, a lot of it's going to be finding, um, finding ways to solve the, the um, to rebuild in a more cost-effective way, and um, and really also to to um, finance um, infill development after the fire happens, um, and this is going to require again some new revenue streams, whether it's taxing homeowners in the Wuyi or something else. Um, obviously, we'd like to prevent displacement to the extent possible by um, by better preparation. Um, incentivizing lower risk development is going to be really important as part of the puzzle. Um, we see local and regional capacity to respond as being really key and the, the MTC ABAG has a really big role here to make sure that our communities, 101 Bay Area uh, municipalities are ready to, um, to to rebuild after fire, that they're um, that they're not just going to pass out FEMA funds, uh, but help people uh, find a better way to grow back. Um, and then, obviously, the insurance is a is a big piece of the puzzle. Um, so, just to wrap up, um, it's it's really um, not just a fire problem that we have now. Um, it's it's a housing crisis uh, that is colliding with the climate crisis as you as our climate driven fires are destroying homes um, and displacing people and resulting in, in more homelessness. Um, it's, it's a huge fiscal and financial problem that our state and municipalities have to figure out. Obviously, it's an environmental problem for e in terms of emissions and habitats. It's an insurance problem that's going to hit every single uh, Californian in the end, if we don't solve it correctly. Um, obviously, it's traumatic um, for, for those that experience it. Um, so it's extremely costly. Um, and it's very disappointing to us um, to see that the state of California uh, consistently is throwing money into hardening and defensible space and vegetation management and controlled burns and fire breaks and modeling firefighting but not land use planning. And you know, we have to do all of the above. I, nothing against home hardening, um, but without land use planning, we're just gonna uh, be back at square one every after every fire season. Um, so we need to end wildland sprawl. It's, it's way worse than the costs of sprawl that we have been um, measuring since the 1970s. Uh, wildland sprawl has a tremendous societal cost um, and it's gonna be really important to have, um, have better housing solutions. Um, and that means more infill development, um, building in defendable spaces, building close to services and amenities. So with that, I'm gonna uh, wrap up and turn it back to Amanda. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, that was a great overview of some really important work. And to me, it, it, it brings up a few questions. So we'd love to get questions from the audience. Please feel free to um, drop a question in the Q&A section. Um, to kick us off, I'd like to build on uh, something you were just talking about uh, around the the impacts of 
of climate related displacement on uh, on people because I think you know you've done some great work around uh, housing and displacement issues in the Bay Area in general and I think this is something that that is a very fraught question something people are really worried about how you know what what this intersection between development and displacement is and with climate related displacements it just exacerbates um, this this big question around how we think about uh, more people moving around in different ways and you know you start you touched on this a little bit but how would you say in particular we could approach policies that mitigate the or measures that mitigate the impacts of of this of climate related dis displacements and housing yeah it's it's a huge new problem and i have to say i wasn't even thinking about climate displacement you say even four four years ago um and then we started working with the uh, with the spark uh, effort, um, and um, and then we did. They asked us to do a literature review on climate displacement, which is on our website. And then, oh my God, there there's like 400 different reports and so many wet different ways of thinking about it. And um, it was really eye opening. Um, and what what I realized for the first time was that we are cre we're in a situation where. Uh, vast numbers of Americans are doubly vulnerable. They're vulnerable uh, to displacement from the housing crisis and from rising uh, costs of, of housing, and uh, they're vulnerable because of where their housing is located. And, um, and this creates um, a whole new le level of um, anti-displacement policy that we need. So, you know, so in, in, in our literature review, we looked at the different types of climate disasters and the different uh, impacts. And I mean, so there's, there's things that we think about in the Bay Area all the time, like sea level rise, hits low income communities in particular, um, fire, um, we just talked about, we just talked about Santa Rosa and the WUI and um, many of the folks living in the WUI are low and moderate income families that are there because they were driving till they could qualify. So um, uh, you know, it's many of the fire um, endangered communities are also affluent in the hills. You could think of Berkeley and Oakland, right? But but there's a huge number of affordable homes um, in, in fire vulnerable areas. Um, and even if you think about policies like um, public housing, um, some of the public housing that we built is on the most climate vulnerable land because uh, it was low hanging fruit. It was where you could build without resistance uh, in the industrial area. Um, so, so we've 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 made this debacle for ourselves. We put ourselves in this position, and um, you know, I think uh, I think we're going to have to really understand the true cost of double vulnerability. And I mean, I, I've often wanted to do a study. I've never gotten a chance to do this study, but my dream study, if there are any funders out there, my dream study is of the cost of displacement uh, because we haven't really had a chance. There's a great urban institute study which looks at the cost of segregation and shows in terms of schools and opportunity and so forth, what those long-term costs are. But the cost of displacement, I would argue, in terms of interrupted um, life courses, in terms of interrupted schooling for kids, um, you know, are very, very high. Um, we've seen it. We looked at urban renewal. Folks have looked at urban renewal and a million uh, households, you know, have, were displaced by urban renewal, another million by the Interstate Highway Act. Um, and those, those, um, you know, some of those stories have been documented, but I don't think we have a good sense of the cost of displacement. So we have to do that first, and then we have to look at the cost of uh, of climate displacement uh, together with it. And and thinking about again, just like we were with the fire work, thinking about the societal cost, thinking about what California taxpayers are going to pay, because that's what it really comes down to. We are all going to pay through our taxes. Up for the fire disaster that we are in. Uh, so, so keep, keeping on this this theme of, of the challenges, I think particularly in you know residents that are most vulnerable. We know that in planning, um, you know, we 
equity really needs to be at the forefront and often is not. Um, and at the same time, I think one you know, initial way that that uh, you know even you know well-meaning cities and planners and others think about how do we get more voices involved, get more people involved, um, you know, ending up with these very long, drawn out planning processes uh, that, uh, you know, whereas when we're thinking about the, the type of action we need, we, we need to move more quickly in both building more homes, in, you know, putting in legislation that protects and, and policies and, you know, how are we, we protecting and not, not building these areas. So, uh, it feels like, and I think I often grapple with this question of a sense of urgency and a challenge in how are we, you know, ensuring that uh, we're centering voices of, of affected residents, that we're bringing in people that aren't uh, necessarily traditionally involved, that aren't following these on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, how do you, what are some ideas for <laughs> how we can, you know, do planning better um, in a way that actually gets us to where we need to go faster and more equitably? <laughs> so you always ask the easy question. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is this is just it, it's so hard, and it's you know we're all feeling it mostly because our kids have really been telling us we we need to act and we're sort of realizing boy uh you know we we thought we had the luxury of time and um and we didn't i mean we've been working on these things for 20 years and look where we are we're you know the first report on the importance of infill housing was you know john landis in 1996 that's 25 years ago um so um and and we still haven't built much infill housing at all so um it, it's really crazy so, you know, we were, I was really struck in terms of time frame. the biggest lesson for me was when we were doing the Santa Rosa study and um, I went up with some students, we volunteered because as it happened, we were studying the 2017 Tubbs fire in um, Santa Rosa and then, but the, the class was uh, 2020, am I getting my years right? 2020, yeah, and uh, in the fall and the fires resumed in Santa Rosa. So we went up and saw how they were, how they were responding. And boy, they were fast, they were taking action. And it, it, was, um, it was impressive. And we talked to the planning director and everybody was, you know, all their resources were marshaled and they got the emergency centers up and going. They, they were rolling out FEMA money and, and it was so fast and efficient. And yet you couldn't help but wonder, um, what if Santa Rosa had had a plan in place um, right then for infill housing? Like what if they had thought long-term and short-term at the same time? Um, and couldn't they have then um, had a more equitable um, kind of response? Because in many ways, when we act quickly, to respond to fire, um, we may be acting in the most inequitable way. You know, it's the richest homeowners that need the most resources to, to protect their homes. You know, you fight to fight a McMansion fire takes a lot more resources than fighting a mobile home fire, right? Um, and um, and so we're and then we're you know they're demanding resources and 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 for for rebuilding. Um, and so that so then and then the the renters. Are left out of the equation altogether. So, so what if we, you know, before the fire happened, what if we found out, you know, what if we talked to the renters? What if we had them, um, you know, put a plan in place um, for, um, you know, to think about what they would do and where they could go, and um, and um, and then what if we had already built. Um, you know, temporary infill housing, uh, so that they could relocate um, uh, in a, in, you know, expeditiously. So, so that's that's a that's a huge um, that's a huge piece of it is thinking thinking short term and long term at the same time. Um, but you know, I think also, um, you know, equity in the end, equity has to be the purview of higher levels of government. It has to happen at the regional level. It has to happen at the state level. And more than anything, it has to happen at the federal level. And um, to be, you know, we, we, I think we ask way too much of our cities in terms of trying to remedy structural inequities. 
Um, and so the good hearted cities, you know, the Berkeleys and San Francisco's of the world, you know, do everything uh, they can, but they, they, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a Sisyphean task, right? Um, and so it, it, you know, we really need to, to ask our regional governments, um, you know, to, to help us for, to, to, you know, to be thinking about equity, um, to be, to be um, to be putting the incentive structures in place so that when you have the disaster, that you won't have the more inequitable outcomes. Yeah, some, some you know challenging questions. Uh, we have a, a couple questions that, that has come up. One, I will just briefly address. There's a question about um, home hardening technology and does and I think I think with it with the uh, the implication that. Um, with all these policies around home hardening um, in a wildfire, does it really actually make a difference um, or is it just prolonging the inevitable of losing one's home? Um, I know I had had some interesting conversations with, with the insurance industry and some others around, uh, around this question. And you know, is, is there, because you do see that here at a lot, like, you know, make sure you have defensible space around your house or you need to change your roof, uh, and other things and with the, so that the understanding I have and that was interesting in because one of the things we do sometimes is look at uh, on the east coast, particularly in hurricane prone areas it's a place where uh, probably it's the most experience of having the same you know, weather challenges over and over again. Uh, and you know looking in places like particularly the Florida coast but but other places as well and, and what that means. And I think if, if you really want to build a house that is uh, hurricane proof, you can, you can, you know, it's expensive, but you can reinforce it. And you sometimes see these pictures of like a, a place where a hurricane is swept, you know, all the homes except one still sitting there. Um, but in these intense sort of mega wildfires, there's really nothing you can do to your home that's going to prevent it from burning down in, you know, again, not in, not in every fire, but in a, in a really intense wildfire that even if you have, you know, your cement home and your metal uh, roof, you know, you just end up at a, at, at a level of heat that, that the whole house will explode uh, was sort of the, the horrifying image that, that is, you know, the reality. So I think it's, you know, it goes back to your, big point um, at, around the study that all of the things the state is doing is important, but land use and fire, and again, this is something that even a few years ago in doing this work, it, it didn't come up. And so I think for the fire prevention community, it's, it's a new conversation, but like we need to have this, you know, these working together between land use planning and, and and fire prevention and fire management much more intensely to ensure that we are as much as possible reducing the risks, reducing the number of homes that are that are vulnerable. So our resources can be focused where they need to focus and we can make these investments in protecting areas and then building enough homes in those areas so more people are protected. It's like, um, so, uh, so I think, um, we have we have a few minutes left, so I wanted to kind of sneak in one, more, you know, a couple more questions. Um, getting to uh, kind of the bigger, like stepping away from just wildfire necessarily, but really getting into some of these questions about uh, housing and building homes. And you know, I appreciated the kind of your framing around what it means to build infill development, and it's not just close to. You know, it's not just right at the at the BART station or something, but we really do need to like think more comprehensively about about what's um, what's a, what's the right place to build housing, um, and then also um, uh, how we incentivize that. So we know we need to build housing of all income levels and more affordable housing, particularly near transit. Uh, so, do you have thoughts on recommendations for policies and programs? perhaps an affordable housing overlay, if you could talk a little bit about that, which we were just chatting about that right before. And I think it's, it's a very interesting policy. We'd love to hear your thoughts on. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we don't have many, uh, we don't have that many tools at our disposal. Um, and we have to be a little bit 
um, more practical. And so just to get to your, the, your first point about the, um, the, how you define infill and how you define transit access. And, you know, we've, we've really limited ourselves in, in a lot of legislation by saying you have to have, you have to be within half mile of high, frequ high frequency transit. And, um, you know, when, you know, there could be, uh, th there's many different ways to get to transit um, and land costs are super high in these uh, transit rich areas. So you go a little bit further away from transit, you can build many more houses, affordable houses. So, and then an affordable housing overlay is a, is a zoning tool. It's, it's not heavily, um, it hasn't been heavily utilized. It hasn't been studied yet. I would, that's what we were talking about that before that we can't find that we couldn't find an evaluation. We looked for one recently, um, but that, but, but the idea is uh, of using, I mean, zoning right now is conferring windfall profits on people who own land. Um, and uh, this, you, this is something uh, th this is a huge uh, problem in terms of inequalities um, in the Bay Area, and it's um, uh, and it's only getting worse as we, you know, we um, we do we upzone. We want to upzone. We want more density. We upzone, and then we don't cost it out properly. So we give away um, uh, lots of side benefits to people that happen to live nearby, uh, nearby the higher density, nearby the transit, um, they're all getting windfalls. Um, anybody who's a homeowner in, um, in most Bay Area communities has gotten a huge windfall. Um, so we need to use that zoning much more effectively um, to recapture some of that windfall for the public good. And I think the affordable housing overlay, which would simply say, you know, you have to say, it, there, there's different examples, but there's, um, you know, you could say for every thousand foot, we'll let you to build a thousand foot more density if you build an a thousand foot uh, a square foot of affordable unit. Um, and this is something Seattle has a has a policy like that. It's not quite an overlay, but they have a, a bonus for um, oh for for uh, for affordability. San Diego has a pilot program um, in this uh, vein too. So you know, some making those uh, building those incentives in you know, saying not never giving away density, um, but making sure that every bit of density that cities give to landowners comes with more affordability. And that's what the uh, type of overlay policy could get us or a density bonus for that matter. Mm -hmm. So we're getting close to the end uh, and I don't wanna let people get on with their day, but I feel like we have a good uh, last question here um, from someone who's in San Diego. Uh, who says, uh, how do we get buy-in for infill? Um, I've seen signs in my area that are against ADUs and people seem to be against affordable housing developments in general. How do we change the public's hearts and minds? Yeah, this is the million dollar question, right? And everybody is struggling with it right now. I'm working myself on doing a series of explainer videos. I'm having my class. Um, each, we're gonna do, each group has to do an explainer video to stop NIMBYs. Um, and, but that, you know, um, I think we can learn a little bit from the example of the ADUs, for instance, that have been built and whether, you know, initially in Portland and then now 23,000 in California in the last three years. Um, and when people start seeing these and they start seeing, oh, uh, you know, there is not, there's no parking problem. Um, my view isn't blocked. I didn't lose my my son. Um, you know, I, uh, I um, you know, I don't even see the people that live back there. You know, when they start to realize what this density is, I mean, my favorite example is in, I always use the example of the the Trader Joe's in Berkeley, which you know the it, it's a five story building in on University Avenue, and um, and the neighbors fought it um, like crazy, and you know, but they stopped it for eight years, and then at the end they started shopping in the Trader Joe's on the ground floor. They were just so excited to have a supermarket in the area, um, and there was no parking problem. They put all these protections in place. There was no parking problem that emerged even with a Trader Joe's there. Um, so, you know, you, you just, you, you need more density, you need to experience it, you need to demystify it. 
Um, and, uh, you know, and the, it, the problem is the change is so slow. The education process has been so slow, right? We've been working on this in California. We've been working on smart growth for 40 years um, or longer. And uh, so, and we still, we've gotten more acceptance, particularly from the younger generations, uh, but we're not where we need to be. So we probably need to build more faster um, in the next backyard over from the NIMBY folks so that they can see how great the new cottage is. Great. So, right. So everyone do your part. If you have a home, build an build. ADU. <laughs> That's um, great. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for being here with us uh, tonight. Pleasure. We really appreciate it. Um, it's been really fun to talk. Uh, I now have <laughs> three or four ideas for um, research we could collaborate on together. Um, we great. really appreciate the collaboration between uh, research that we can point to in our advocacy uh, that, that makes a big difference because people, they want to know, they don't really want the details of the statistics, but they really want you to know that you have some statistics back, backing um, yep. what you're saying. Uh, so right. I think it's a great combination of having the research, being able to point to it, and then uh, for us, again, making that making that advocacy case, showing people, having people stand up and say why it's, why it's helped themselves in their own lives uh, and their community and how we build the communities that we all, that we all want to live in. So uh, it's great to partner. Um, just a few, uh, a few little um, house, housekeeping questions here as well. Um, our Resilience Playbook webinar series, of which this is the first one, um, will continue next week, same time. Uh, we'll be discussing the housing elements update process um, with Mayor of Berkeley, Jesse Arrigan, and Aaron Eckhouse from California Yimby. That's gonna be a really good one. And as I mentioned, all communities in the Bay Area are updating their housing elements uh, this year, so it's relevant for everyone. Right after we close this webinar, you'll see a feedback survey pop, pop up. Please uh, take that very quick survey. Your input's very helpful for us. Um, and finally, the work we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and working lands while also creating thriving communities is made possible 